You could be jumping out of a plane, skiing down a mountain, partying in the Bahamas. But instead, thanks for downloading the Note Show podcast, featuring interviews that will arouse your curiosity and expand your imagination. The possibilities are endless, and the adventure starts now. Kind of. Here's your host, Joshua Note. John Broomhall, Daryl Alexander, Steve Schnur, Jessica Curry, Gary Scheiman, Jason Graves, Richard Jacks, Olivier Derivier, our old friend and guest from when the podcast was just beginning. We love Olivier, David Housden, and Tom Colvin. Don't those names just sound wonderful? Well, for a little bit more information, let's say things like Halo 4, Beyond Two Souls, uh, Transport Tycoon. Let's see. Everybody's gone to the Rapture, Dear Asta. Tomb Raider, Dead Space, Mass Effect, Little Big Planet, Devil May Cry, Heavenly Sword, Remember Me, Alone in the Dark, Assassin's Creed 4, Freedom Cry, and so much more. Doesn't that sound wonderful? Those names and all those things all put together just sound awesome. Because I think they do. Well, Those names are the composers, and in Jessica Curry's case, the co-director of The Chinese Room. And Steve Schnur is the worldwide executive of music and marketing at Electronic Arts. All of them put together in one big musical mishmash pie. Sounds like a wonderful, delicious treat. Next week, they'll be convening at the South Bank Centre in London. I will be there. So will so many amazing, interesting young people aspiring to video game composition professionals from the industry. And a lot of exciting stuff will be being talked about. And if you want a taster, why not just hang around for this episode? Because I have one of the co-founders, along with John Broomhall, my guest this week is James Hannigan, five times BAFTA nominated composer. I'm so thrilled to have had him as a guest. I had a wonderful time talking to him. And through this episode, he will just take you through all sorts of his philosophy and thoughts on game music, composing the industry as a whole, how films have influenced games, diegetic music, you know, if you're into that thing and uh, so much more. It was really, really exciting. So we are back and this is a really exciting episode. I hope you enjoy it. And again, 24th of September, the South Bank Centre in London. If you're around, that's London, UK, not one of those smaller, inferior, imposter Londons, you know. But if you are around and you're interested in video game music, you can get tickets now. Just type in Game Music Connect. They're on Twitter at Game Art Connect. And Honestly, just try and make it along and there'll be so much cool stuff going on. I just can't wait. It's, I've been looking forward to it for a month now. So without further ado, let's get down to talking with James Hannigan. Don't miss a note. Catch all episodes of The Note Show on iTunes and Stitcher. Mr. James Hannigan, welcome to the show. It is an absolute honor and a pleasure to listen and to talk to, I should say, the man whose music I have been listening to nonstop now for a few days and uh, really loving. So how are you today? I'm fine. And, uh, you know, it's it's great to do this. So thanks for having me on. No, absolutely. You have done just amazing stuff. Dead Space stuff is astonishing. Thank you. Uh, Oh, really, just really moving. And, uh, and, you know, I'm terrified to play the game, but I love the soundtrack. Um, But uh, no, it's it's just absolutely excellent. So you are nominated, I believe, for five BAFTAs. at the last count, yeah, I think so. <laughs> <laughs> it's no small feat, uh, and you have done so much stuff, and we're going to talk about uh, this conference that's coming up because you are kind of recognized as a speaker. You do a lot of video, uh, radio interviews, and you talk about video game music and some of your thoughts on uh, video game music and diegetic music, which are really interesting, I want to delve into. So, yeah. no, I'm just totally excited, but let's begin with uh, what are you up to lately? How's James Hannigan doing this week? Well, this week, you know, it's all it's all go really in connection with the event. Um, mm. There's just so much to sort out. Um, as someone who's kind of involved in the content and putting it on as well with uh, sure. my co-founder John Broomhall. Um, Got to mention John. I can't. I can't leave him out. Always going to mention um, John. Yeah, I yeah, mention. I mention him on every episode just for the sake of it. Really? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You should just like throw John. He's a very John important person in the, in the in the games audio world. 
um, and a good friend. But um, he, basically, uh, that's what I'm doing at the moment. I mean, I'm just trying to get everything together, ready for September the 24th. And uh, work is kind of having to take a backseat. I mean, normal kind of day-to-day work a couple of projects on the go a couple of indie games that i can't talk about which is quite a departure for me <laughs> it's, um, it's always awesome when i when i have a guest on an exciting guest especially who brings up right at the beginning of the interview i can't actually talk about what i'm working on i know well you know <laughs> I tell you, that's just yeah it's a story of my life a story of <laughs> anybody who works in games will tell you you know it's just you know this nda uh, nonsense really i mean uh, i I mean, I understand why they do it, but it it can be really, really excessive sometimes because, you know, a lot of these games, they can go on in development for for years sometimes. It's very, Mm. very frustrating not to be able to talk about it or not even to be able to say that you're attached to something. I mean, I don't know what the harm could possibly be there, you know, just saying that you're working on something that is known to exist. But, uh, you know, even that's too much. Well, especially with, you know, I imagine, especially with the fact that we, it's this industry where gossip is just, one person mentions one thing, it's all over, you know, before a game comes out, mm. everyone everyone knows who's working on it anyway, in one way or another, you know, it's it's always, uh, it's always out. I know, you know, and you don't, you don't see this in other entertainment industries, do you? You don't see it in film and TV. When someone's attached to some a TV show or a, a film, or even you know any member of the crew, will just go up on IMDb, yeah, yeah, the and internet it, movie database, you know, and will just list everybody who's working on it, and big deal. Or, or leak on yeah, IO9. I follow their blog, and you know, Batman versus Superman. We've already seen all the costumes, yeah. the Batcar, and everything, and and. And, you know, they're just as big, but I, I like the fact that we're talking about two projects that you said are indie games, especially because, uh, first of all, I love indie games and the stuff that's happening at the moment in the last few years has been really interesting. But uh, it's amazing that that culture itself, I mean, that's a big gossip culture. It's a big news culture and, and people are hanging on every, you know, the latest release and everything. It's becoming this like sort of little rock star world. But, yeah. You know, I mean, what do you think of that? That's let's let's go straight into asking yeah. some big philosophical questions or something like that. Let's let's. What does James Hannigan think about? I mean, do you? What's the difference between working on, you know, these really big franchise games that you've done, uh, especially you know the movie attached ones, uh, which is so famous and so well known? What's the difference for you mentally going into working on one of those or going into working on one of these secret indie projects? Well, to tell you the truth, I mean, as as a composer or a musician I, I just wouldn't i don't think there should be a difference oh really yeah i think that uh, i mean the business model is different right but uh, when i say i don't think there's a difference i mean there there are differences in the differences in the way that you uh maybe engage with each sector and i don't know i mean what i'm trying to say is creatively speaking i mean you just try to do the most appropriate music and the best you can for right. the project you're working on. I'm talking strictly in terms of the music. I don't think there's a, you know, I think it's a false dichotomy to say that, you know, indie games are over here and AAA games are over there. And they just, what's different is the business model. What about and, resources? Well, of course that yeah. as well. I mean, practical things. I mean, that's undeniable. I mean, the AA, uh, AAA games are, have the funding and probably on a larger scale and you may be able to, I don't know, adopt more kind of, um, they have bigger production values basically. But, uh, that, I mean, just essentially in terms of music and the way the music functions in the game, I think you just treat each game and just, you just take it as it is. It doesn't matter what sector it's in. Right. Not for me anyway. I mean, in fact, working on indie games, uh, now or just starting to kind of feels like, working in the so-called mainstream or traditional industry a long time ago. That's the interesting oh, thing really? for me. Yeah, because back then when I got involved in it, I mean, obviously I wasn't involved at the very beginning of video games or anything, but talking about 20 years ago, um, you know, there was still perhaps more creative freedom uh, possible uh, even in AAA games, I mean, there wasn't quite as much pressure to, to, you know, to be like this, to be like that composer or film. It's film didn't exert as much of an influence over games. That's one thing. Mm. So I think indie games are kind of um, they're games in a sort of truer sense. I mean, they're, they're, there's less kind of um, influence from film and TV in particular. I think they're probably, probably that's the biggest difference, I guess, aesthetically. 
Hmm. So w- when you say that, because that's really interesting, and I really want to go back 20 years and talk about uh, you beginning in the, the industry and what, how you think things have changed, because that that's fascinating. But um, so i got to ask this. I don't want to sound uh, like I, I'm totally inept here, but uh, I'm going to take a shot in the dark and say, you're not talking about the fact that nowadays there are huge orchestras. Cause I've, I've read that you think that if possible, live music should be used uh, rather oh. than synthesizers and, and things like that. Is that? No, uh, no, actually I don't, that's not what I feel really. I mean, ah. what, what I meant, I, I, I don't know, it's probably the way I made it sound, but actually I think probably what I was trying to say there was that if you, if you're going for the sound of an orchestra, like if that, you know, if you're working within orchestral, the orchestral oh, paradigm, okay. then I would say go for the real thing rather than fake it if yeah. you can. And if you can't do that, then maybe you should be thinking about something else that you can achieve. A different- it's just this, yeah, it's just this, a different approach altogether. It's just that what I don't like is this kind of when you're in a corner and you feel you have to do something that you know is going to be perceived as second best just because oh yes, yes yeah you know like someone says oh we want an orchestral score but without an orchestra and i'm not saying that samples aren't good and sample libraries aren't getting better all the time but given the option i think if you're going to go down that route use an orchestra you know if you want to make orchestral music that's right. if you can uh, or you know always just look at maximizing just look at getting the best out of the budget you have and delivering the best music you're able to with the resources you have i think that's the what i'm essentially trying to say i'm not trying to say that all music in games should be live or acoustic no, sure, I understand. definitely not i mean sometimes it should be and maybe in those sort of big games that are a little more filmic and uh, do draw on the, the language of cinema if you like that then there is a case for going down that route but i, I certainly wouldn't apply that to all games yeah. <laughs> Right. So, well, since we got straight into this, what I was going to ask is, what, other than the the specific the practicalities of, of music, then when you say uh, you know mainstream or AAA games or whatever you want to call it, you know the, those those things, uh, the influence of film on them, how how much? First of all, how much do you think that's grown in the last ten years? And second of all, do you find? I mean, is that based upon expectations that films that the, the, the sort of film aesthetics leak into and is it, is it based upon limitations maybe thrown at or put on the composer because people expect mm. here's a fight scene we need the drums or we yeah. need the yeah so that's if we can delve into that well, a little bit you know i think there are uh, several things that have led to this um and i'm not against it can i just say that i you know i like those filmic games and i like action adventure games and i i don't you know it suits me quite well because i like film music me too yeah you know, i don't mind the influence um but i think it happened you know there, there, there are several things that influence it i mean first of all technology itself determines content a lot of the time so early games music sounded like it did and i'm talking about chip music and sound card music because it had to didn't it? I mean, there wasn't any option for composers. Limited, yeah. yeah. And when people, you know, the people who liked games music from that era, you know, they liked it partly because they enjoyed the music and the meaning in the music, but they also liked it because they were impressed by the, the fact that you could get good music out of the hardware and it was being created live inside the machine. Do you know what I mean? There was yeah. this sort of fascination that people had with the making music from a from a sound chip, you know, when you can only combine three sounds or something at once. Well, uh, and, and some beautiful, the, beautiful music. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. But it's special and it's unique and it was seen as a specialism. You know, there was a, such a thing as a games composer. Yeah, yeah. sure. Uh, and I think what, what changed was digital audio, really. That's when, you know, there are, well, there, there are several forces at work, I think. That the, the, in terms of the technology and the production, it was digital audio coming into games. Mm. I mean, because then, you know, that really leveled the playing field with everything else. I mean, that was when you could put anything into a game and that could be a piece of recorded music. So it wasn't coming, you know, it wasn't live and coming out of the console. Right. It was a piece of, you know, here's some music I baked earlier. Kind of <laughs> yeah, that's a yeah. way to put it. Okay. Well, yeah. it, 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 you know, well, it is often referred to as baked music. Oh, really? Know. Yeah, yeah. Um, so... A lot of most music, most music in games is baked, really. I mean, you know, we're taking bits of recorded music and just sticking them in games, and it's not created by the machine or the hardware. Sure, 
it's just it's like it is in a film or it's exactly the same you know but the process of composing is different of course um but uh in terms of the playback it's a similar kind of concept and method that's right. used so that's the first thing so that's a kind of convergence in production mm. you know so people start you know started to see that they could make music in the same way as they could in the film industry and then probably the expectation grew that that kind of well, music should be there. I, I think then, you know, that, that in itself, I, I think, doesn't explain why the language of film came into games. I think that what happened there was that when whenever there's a new medium, mm. whenever a new form emerges, it tends to mimic whatever's come before. You know, then, then you know, people started to look for ways of telling stories in games and... Uh, the, you know, the environments became richer and the reality in games became more and more filmic. And, the, you know, films just, they're just the convenient thing. You know, there's a model that already exists. There's a language, an emotional language mm. for music and everybody understands it. Everybody knows what sad music is. Everybody knows what, you know, the, the, people just use these words like cinematic and epic and all that kind of yeah, thing. But yeah. what they're talking about, obviously, is the language of Oh. Film music, yeah, and I think that it was just—it was a ready-made, it's a model that could be adopted and apl applied to games. It's as simple as that. That rather than you know, why think up a new language? You're not going to re reinvent the wheel. So, right, it, it's like uh, there's a an academic that I know quite well who wrote a really interesting paper on this. His name's Stephen Deutsch. Um, he's a professor at. We used to be at uh, Bournemouth University and the tutor at the National Film and Television School. And he wrote this amazing paper once that sort of talked about this. It's worth looking it up. Um, I will, definitely. That yeah, sounds great. You know, he, 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 you know he's, he's, his uh, examples were, you know, uh, the computer keyboard looked like a, a typewriter. You know, I get this is an example of a new form of technology mimicking mimicking an old one. You uh -huh. see what I mean? Yeah. Uh, the first cars looked like horseless carriages. You know, you, you see this whenever there's some, you know, a new technology emerging, it tends to, well, you know, if it's a new experience, it tends like, like a, a game. Use old it tends to, yeah, it, used, it tends to replicate the experiences people are already familiar with. Right. And of course, over time, you know, initially that took the form of live action, didn't it? I mean, Wing Commander and things like that. And people actually started putting real films into games. Mm. I mean, uh, and then those those linear sequences have become more and more integrated with the gameplay and more and more embedded in the experience. And there's been this kind of weird, you know, well, not weird. I mean, it, it, there's been an attempt to try to get this, uh, get the two to gel, you know, it's sort of the, the role of the, the player as a passive audience and being told a story, but also taking a part in the game. And so you get this sort of sense of, you know, I'm playing the game, then it's being interrupted and, by a cut scene and being told a story and it sort of works, but it still to me feels like a work in progress. You know what I mean? It's still sort of, um, the industry is still trying to work out uh, what it's trying to achieve, I think. Uh -huh. uh, but, uh, so, but I, I just think that it's as simple as that, that the, you know, it was a ready made language. hundred years uh, old as well. Yeah. And we've just kind of, we're still working out whether that's really a good idea in games or are there certain games where it works better than in others. Right. If you see what I mean. Um, and I've got my own theories about this. I mean... Oh, I'd love to hear them. I'm fascinated well, right now. Absolutely. Well, I, mean, I think that, uh, for example, games that are in the third person... Right. I think are particularly filmic because they imply that there's a camera. Uh, of course. I'm yeah. actually just finally, many years later, playing Uncharted. And I think this definitely applies to that series. Yeah. And you see, because then there's a sense that you are an observer right. as well as a participant in the game. Do you see what I mean? So you're, you're in control of this character, but you're not, it's not you. You are adopting this persona, this character in the game. So there's a sense of kind of, you're in the game, but the story is probably set and it's predetermined. And you're watching the action as well as being part of it. So it's very cinematic, you could say, very right. filmic, the way it's presented. And I think it's, the, it's games like those where that language works, you know, it's most useful to mm. employ. Um, but then there are other games that are in the first person, for example, like uh, simulators, 
That's I, right. I think of Fallout when you say that. The first I was going right. to just ask, what did you think about? I, I, I still to this day don't know how to pronounce it, but I believe it's Einonzer. Um I'm not entirely sure if that's right. I'm but... not going to try. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, at least it's not just me. I feel I feel a little bit okay. I feel no, justified. Right. I mean, yeah, he's uh, done lots of games, but uh, he's. I think yeah, that, that I, was I a very interesting soundtrack to me. If you, yeah, I don't know if you know I'm that. I'm not saying it never works or anything, but mm. I'm just saying that it, it, it's leaning in a certain direction if it implies that it's you in the game and it's your senses. Do you know what I mean? Like your eyes, your ears, <laughs> right. your brain uh, perceiving yeah. the world. That's why I think you know it's questionable what the music really adds because you don't go around hearing music if you're actually supposed to be immersed I, in I'm mildly out. delusional, James, so I do sometimes hear music. Oh, in my- <laughs> okay. and I'm not, as I say, it's a spectrum. You know, and I think I, I'm like, at one end, yeah. Well, I, no, I, I, I am too, and I like that kind of game, and I like that sort of manipulative music that makes me feel things. Okay, yeah. Uh, it's just that, as I say, it's important to recognise there's a kind of spectrum there, and at one end, it really might not be necessary. Like, if you're playing a flight simulator... Mm. what's it going to add if you're really you know if, if this thing is trying to send you a message that you're a pilot then you don't want all this dramatic music commenting on everything you do music has a role to play in determining the nature of the game's reality is what i'm trying to say and basically it can pull very can, much away from that yeah exactly it can push you out and treat you as an audience or it can be absent or minimal or part of the environmental soundscape um, and sort of manipulate your emotions very subtly but not to the extent that it tells you it isn't a real place that you occupy do you see what i mean absolutely this yeah, is and that's what i'm getting at and you know i've been saying this for about 12 years and basically i mean i wrote an article and it was that uh, i had the cover feature of develop i was quite proud at the time <laughs> <laughs> that's cool and, uh, but you know i don't i don't think people really read these things and uh, i just kind of thought oh well forget it you know, oh, I really? Think, yeah, I did, actually. I mean, I, I'll tell you why. I mean, it's, I don't know, I, I'm one of those people probably who thinks, overthinks things, probably. And maybe the industry got it right in not thinking too hard. I mean, just letting it evolve, you know, just sort of finding its way, you know, just finds through trying and experimenting what works. So if you put all this music and it's inappropriate, then it should be obvious. I mean, <laughs> yeah. a, test, I mean a good test, I think, is whether, you know, look at film. And how important sound is in film. And the, the way to find out is just to watch a film and turn the sound off. You know, that's that will tell you how important the sound is. Right. You could try and follow what's going on. Try and enjoy the experience with no sound. But if you can play a game with the sound off, then what it tells you is that the music and sound are not really adding anything to the experience. They're not, you know, there isn't enough meaning in there for it to be important enough for you to hear it. To play the game. Do you see what I mean? Oh, I absolutely. Yeah, I wouldn't, I'm not going to name the games because I, I want to have a oh, career, oh, but I, I've just been recently yeah. yeah, doing that with the sound off and listening to an audiobook at the same exactly. time. Yeah. I think that, you know, all that people in, working in games want is, I mean, people working in audio, sound and music, is for the music to mean something and actually add a dimension. Oh, not absolutely. Just, yeah. And I, so that's. Um, but anyway, so I was just trying to sort of talk about what that dimension is in that uh, particular article. And, uh, can, can I say, though, I mean, the, the thing that you've said, I mean, you just said that you're not sure if anyone reads these things and you're not sure if, it, you know, if it should just find its own way. But I I would say that part of the... Um, the gene- well, that's, I don't want to say genetic evolution. It sounds like it's pompous. But part of the evolution of this... About of this media, I mean, you, we need people like you, surely. I, I believe so. I think we need people like no, we we absolutely do. I mean, I'm sat here. I've just learned a lot already, uh, and and I'm thinking again, again about things that I probably wouldn't have thought about. We need people to question this stuff because it will affect people. People, I mm. believe, people do read these things, and I, well, I'm, I'm yeah. sure there are a lot of people who think about it and do it and apply this kind of thing. It's just that they, you know, they're not that vocal about it. No, speak up, please, Mr. Hannigan. <laughs> well, I mean, I don't know. I mean, I haven't worked on any of the Battlefield games, for example. Right. Um, I mean, I know a few people who work on the team. But, I mean, I get the impression from playing those games that they understand this thing that uh-huh. I'm talking about. And they understand the role that audio has in 
creating the right kind of illusion for that game. Do you know what I mean? And the right kind of, the right level of immersion. Mm. Yeah. Um, yes. And, you know, there are other games, other shooters that you feel they're just way too much music imposed, you know, too much commentary, if you know what I mean. About reiterating doing. something that should be obvious. Telling you what's obvious because you just did it. It's you who's creating the story part of the time. Even if it's a pre-existing one, you want this sense that it's still you who's kind of determining the outcome. Mm, yeah. Things. And uh, so you don't always want to be told what you just did. You know, it's sort of. Uh, <laughs> yeah. It's you might, fun. if you were watching it, watching a film, you want to see, you know, you might want. To, that reinforcement. Yeah. You've got to be aware that, you know, when you're watching a film, the characters in the film, uh, as you, you know, talking about this uh, issue of diegetic versus non diegetic. Yeah, this, yeah, this is interesting. Yeah. But, um, you know, they can't hear the music that the audience can hear. And that's all I'm getting at. I'm just saying it's worth considering what the stems of the soundtrack in a game actually support and why are they organized as they are and the way they're generally organized now i mean for triple a games anyway i mean sort of these filmic action adventure games it is the soundtrack is modeled uh, after the after film after the film model right the way, yeah the, the you know the without really sort of thinking that deeply about what why those stems are as they are why do we have music over here why do we have sound effects over here? And what, you know, why are they separate? You know, what, what is it that they're trying to say? You know, literal sound effects that uh, the audience can hear and the characters in the story world, they can hear it. And, you know, that's something that uh, everyone can hear, if you like. Then you have non-diegetic music, music for the audience. And, of course, occupants of the story world, the characters in the film, can't hear it. Of course. But in games, of course, and, you know, it's pretty obvious But uh, to say this, but you are supposed to be a character in the story world, yet you can hear the music. So mm. what I'm saying is it, it requires, I mean, it's just worth asking the question, isn't it? It's worth raising. No, it's absolutely and, worth it, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's just that I, I, I mean, my feeling is that these things, they don't evolve. You, know, you don't get the right outcome naturally all of the time. Of course do, not. do you know what I mean? I think the future, to some extent, has to be invented you know, I think that it, it, it's sort of, um, I don't know, I think a lot of people, they just think, well, you know, it will kind of sort itself out and it doesn't matter if we really philosophize about these things and question the role and function of music and sound in games. It will just kind of work out. And maybe to some extent, as I was saying earlier, you know, trial and error does lead to some good results. But I, I do think there should be more kind of, um, more of a formal look at this. Or, I mean, there probably is. I mean, there are academics who talk. I mean, I, I didn't know this because I just kind of arrived at this independently by myself. And then you just found through my own experiences yeah. in games. And, and of course, because I work in the industry, I only ever meet people in the industry. I'm not an academic, so I don't uh, know what they're looking at. And just recently, you know, I've been involved in a few uh, events and talks, and I've met with um, various academics and musicologists and people who are looking into this and it's, this is the kind of thing they think about but the problem is what they're doing isn't joined up with the industry no it's, you know the industry yeah. is all, already trapped by its own conventions you know before it's really seen as a i mean okay i mean a lot of people say it's an art form now but it's become big business before it's fully formed do you see what i mean and uh, that didn't, yeah that didn't happen with uh, film, for example, film was allowed to grow, go, yeah. grow before it became big business, and you know before there were Hollywood blockbusters and things like that. So, games, right, that took fifty years, and that's the seventies, yeah, really. Exactly. Games are, you know, it's all blockbuster or bust, and before we really have a handle on what you can do with them, you know. So that's probably, you know, if there is a difference between indie games and AAA games, it's probably that, isn't it? The spirit of, well, I mean, actually the, the funny thing is that the people, as I was saying, the, the division is kind of imaginary really. I mean, and it's, it's imposed by business because a lot of people working in AAA right. games are very, very creative and would easily, you know, move between these sectors and do all kinds of interesting things if they were working in the indie sector. Mm. But they've got to make a living as well, or it's just that they happen to work in what's they start out working in what's called now called the traditional games industry, if you see what I mean. So really, you're kind of um, snookered. Yeah, it's where where you start. That's kind of 
it kind of defines you really so that's yeah that's i mean that's really sort of comes back to that again it is the, the that's what i was wondering the conventions and that and and so you what you said was because I, I i wanted to talk about games music connect because it's it, I, I hope it will connect up with this but um uh, like you said with indie games and that freedom that is comparative or at least that creative choice is comparative to 20 years ago um i suppose that's the original question that i was getting back at so that you, the, the, you treat it philosophically and on many levels you know like obviously you're doing the most appropriate thing for the most appropriate thing at the time and being pragmatic about it like that um i mean i can't ask a stupid question like which do you prefer because that would be nonsense but uh i mean have you worked on an indie game and you know thought this is they've given me the freedom to do something that is not filmic that is not in that vein an indie and, game yeah or, you mean or any any, or any game. game any, any game. game yeah um again i mean there are a number of levels that you work on aren't there really i mean there's the production as i was saying the sort of technical side of it the interactive music the composition and then there's the function of the music and uh you know they all go they all should go hand in hand i mean the music that you create should be an integral part of the game design i feel but i think there are problems in the industry i mean as that i've encountered at least in uh well generally speaking i mean in terms of where where it's felt audio belongs in the scheme of things and i haven't always felt that a game's design is sort of in, fully inclusive in that way it's all it's often felt that even you know even if i've been given free reign over music to some extent the composition i still haven't felt that music has been kind of factored in as an important part of the design right do you, do you see what i mean uh, yeah yeah uh you know for example i mean you might be surprised to hear this but um even on some very very big productions I have, you know, I've had situations where I haven't even been in contact with the designer at all. Really? Yeah, and that's not unusual. I mean, you ask a lot of composers who their point of contact is, at the, the, you know, if they're freelance, uh, and it will be, it's usually the audio department that, uh, at the studio. I mean, that's just, again, it's convention. We're talking about conventions. This is, the audio department is responsible for the audio content i mean of course there are going to be exceptions they're going to be designers who care about the sound and music and they see the game as a whole and you know the role of the music is very very important to them but there are also lots of studios lots of publishers who just think the audio department's over there they just do what they want for the game it's their vision and it's it's a kind of assembly line you know uh-huh, what I mean? uh-huh, where all yeah. these people are working independently and you know there's just got to be some music you know and, uh, sorry, are there any particular companies or anyone that you, you wouldn't mind uh, mentioning that you go, well, that's, no, they, did, not, they, they did that. No, no, I was going to say they did that well. That well, you like, you, that well, you I see, yeah. I mean... Sorry, I wasn't going to yeah, draw you in. I, I know what you're saying, yeah. yeah. Well, it's, it's funnily enough, it's, it's that, that, what I'm talking about is very often the result of the culture and the conventions of the mm. industry rather than the individuals involved. They don't like it either. Ah, uh, so, yeah. Yeah, they don't do it deliberately. It's just they're hoisted by your own petards. With doing it that way, you know what I mean. It's just they it's conditioned to to do it like that. Absolutely, absolutely. No, uh, I, I, this is. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Well, funnily enough, I mean, you know, EA gets yeah. a lot of gets knocked a lot. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And I don't. You know, I'm not going to comment on that. Maybe some of that's justified in certain areas. I don't know. I don't really care about the politics of it all. Sure. Um, but in this way, I haven't found them to be particularly uh, difficult to work with in terms of, you know, I, I, they're quite open to uh, being creative. I've never sort of felt that, um, you know, I've, I've been very satisfied working on some of their games. And I haven't really, it's very rare to be dictated to right. uh, what you have to do. They, right. they seem to be a little bit more uh, open-ended. If, you, if that's the right word, open. Uh, to, yeah, um, yeah, open. Yeah, you know yeah, what I'm trying to say. Absolutely. So, yeah. what one of the games that you worked on with them that you think uh, you feel like you had a lot of creative choice? Well, actually, um, it. Well, I've, I've always felt. I mean, I've, I've never felt particularly inhibited working oh. for EA, but uh, I think more, you know, sort of sort of less inhibited in the past simply because I had a closer connection with the company. Okay, because you were the in-house composer at one point. Yeah, exactly. And uh, at that time, I mean, 
some of the things we were doing, they were really, really out there. You know what I mean? It was just totally not what you would expect in house at EA. Put it that really? way. Yeah, we were approaching I some love to hear stuff like soundtracks uh, almost as if it was electroacoustic composition. You know? Oh. I mean, in, even in in things like even in some EA sports games. I mean, we there weren't that many that passed through the studio. But uh, in the UK, but um, some of the time, I mean, we, you know, we did have EA Sports games, and uh, there are a couple of examples, uh, a couple of manager games that uh, I can remember working on. Uh, God, I don't know, about ninety-five, ninety-six, or something like that. So a long time ago. <laughs> that was about nine. <laughs> yeah, and I don't, you know, I don't know if it was because uh, nobody cared about the sound of music. And they just like you. Know, it was just sort of indifferent. It didn't really matter one way or the other. Or it was because they genuinely, you know, there was no model. Probably, you know, they, there wasn't anything to copy. It was <laughs> right. still, no, still kind of relatively uninfluenced by, um, I don't know, sports, television or MTV. Or, or I mean, there's nothing wrong with the approach they take now. I mean, I think it works really, really well. But I'm just giving you an example of how things have changed when things were forming, how it was possible to to be creative, even in the context of a mainstream game you mm. know? and uh yeah there was this one game in particular i don't think it was hugely successful it was a fifa soccer manager i think it was I never played um, those yeah and uh there was no music at all but there was this kind of emotionally resonant soundscape that we did and it was sort of themed because you know we just had this again it was this thing about what can you add to a game like that um it's a very yeah emotionally yeah, like a speaking it's like, and things yeah. like that basically. <laughs> so I'm not gonna have any Anna Jones music playing. Yeah, yeah. I mean, no. They pro- actually, I think probably the approach that would be taken now probably more, more effective just to have a kind of jukebox thing, oh. you know, just to have this kind of motivating music that works as well in a different way. But we had the idea of um, creating a soundscape that was appropriate for the area you were in. Like, you know, if it was training, you'd hear this kind of training atmosphere or a spreadsheet, a kind of office atmosphere. But we did it, we sort of approached it almost as a piece of music. Mm. So we, for the finance section, we'd have coins spinning around and bags of money. And we'd have them sort of panning <laughs> that around. Really cool. yeah. yeah, so it was, it was almost like a composition. And uh, the programmer, uh, well, the... the guy who was implementing it is someone called Nick Laviers, who um, is uh, quite a big audio director now working in LA. He's got loads of credits and uh, he, well, we were, it was essentially us who, who did this project together. And he, you know, he created all these algorithms that recreated the sound of a typewriter. <laughs> that, that, so we didn't record a typewriter, someone typing. We actually recorded, you know, single keystrokes Amazing. And then had algorithms that made it sound like a typewriter. Do you see what I mean? Yeah. So sequencing typewriter. So rather than having a repetitive yeah. rhythmic track, it, yeah, it changed. That kind of thing. So this was a kind of evolving soundscape. Oh, there's so much, you know, I wouldn't but, have imagined that so much no, thought went into well, that. Nobody That's amazing. else would either. For, <laughs> that's why nobody noticed. People, I don't know, maybe people just thought it didn't matter or it was just some huge recording in the background. No, I think I, I, well, I mean, it's a shame. Notice yeah. now, probably more because people are more receptive to this kind of thing. But the irony sure. is that you can't do that thing as often as you could back then. So, the, the, yeah, this is. I mean, this so far, this has been really interesting. We've, we've. I mean, basically, what we've dug out is. I mean, as you see it, we've we've taken on these conventions of films. Things have grown so much, and I, I like the way you use that. That is, it's irony. It is the only way to describe it. Um, at a time when you know people now are interested in video game mm. soundtracks, but you know, even to, well, you know that explains the interest perhaps in indie games, isn't it? Is that people yeah. are looking to that? They're looking to that sector to come up with something they're different from the mainstream, and, yes. I, and and also there is the there is the the the. I mean, I'm I'm a producer of an indie game, and the the I find that people feel connected to it because it's small because there are people whose names i mean even when when the signed mm. ndas you know you're talking about small teams of people that do connect and there is the chance that creativity 
can and there is there's been some really interesting things come out uh yeah. recently you know um and uh you know i loved gone home i just played that and that was that was very different sort of game to one i've ever played uh but the the yeah i mean i'm sort of i'm sort of a little bit sad if i'm really honest about mm. the way this has gone now you've described it, i got a little bit of a downer but it's great well, to hear i well, think you see that i i it's it's not over yet, is it? I mean, it's not... Uh, James Hannigan's I, last stand. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, I mean, the, you know, it's not over for the industry. It's, mm. I mean, it's sad, in a way, that there is this kind of fracture that exists yeah. between them. But I don't think it will last that long, because if you look at the... Again, you know, if you look towards film and the way that's evolved, I mean, maybe games will evolve along similar lines, I mean, in a business way. Um, you know, because you have this fairly healthy independent sector in film obviously a lot of people complain about the same things like low budgets and yeah, sure. what have you but indie film does exert a big influence on hollywood mm. you know if you have a breakout indie hit like low budget hit that's very very profitable then you find that things you know, follow yeah and hollywood starts to kind of um, make films along those lines it learns so mm. it's kind of it needs the indie sector to sort of show what's possible when there are no yeah. constraints. I'm going to take one little opportunity. Just anyone listening, James and I are obviously both English, and I just want to say one thing: our country, wonderful in so many ways, it has been absolutely diabolical and terrible in our support of a British independent movie compared with France, mm. compared with Spain, compared with Germany. It's disgusting, and people should be hanged for it. Quite frankly, I, I hope that people actually get interested. I'm going to write an article on this soon. Sorry, it's something that burns no, away at I mean, me. Well, you know, it, not only to film. I mean, the games industry as well. I mean, it's only just i don't know the details of it but it's only recently the tax breaks have been yeah really recently and that totally decimated the industry you know the move that i think many felt they had to make Mm. overseas to um which is terrible i mean our history in gaming is one of the most illustrious and most innovative and and best histories of all and it's when you say when i i i'm not i'm not going to get too into it but you know i myself uh, working with a group of people and becoming a producer of a game and have had to deal with this kind mm. of stuff. And, and it's, it's been, you know, terrible. And, and, but also I'm very aware of my, my, my brethren who make movies and they've told me their situation and it's even worse in a way, but we really should be focusing on British video games, British. I mean, well, <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's just a case of, I mean, it's not that, you know, it's not just that w- one particular country is better than all the others or anything. It's just being able to work in your own country. No, that's what I mean. Yeah, nice yeah. for anybody, you know, Absolutely. so that, without having to go to other countries and of course it affects you know so the same is happening in say uh hollywood with orchestral music and the, the unions there and you get lots of recording in other countries and they obviously feel upset about that because they've got to leave the states to record absolutely uh, and yeah oh. the same you know people just yeah. want to work in an environment that's that's familiar to them absolutely and to have your own government not providing the the right conditions to allow yeah. an industry to thrive is it's not exactly very forward looking but i think that it's um has been addressed hasn't it in games at least um, i'm not so, sure well, yeah absolutely mm. absolutely absolutely but you know we can talk about hollywood a lot of my friends are now having to move to canada to the animation studios yeah. up there you know and similar situation similar situation um but no, it's just interesting. It's just one of these things that it kind of bothers me. And, uh, you know, I, I'm always looking for the release of, you know, British independent movies that I like. And, yes. they're, you know, we just, we don't see them think. absolutely smuggled over by, uh, uh, you know, big Hollywood blockbusters. Anyway, the, the fact of the matter is, is oh, yeah, it's one of those issues close to my heart, obviously, and yours. Mm-hmm. Um, but the... What I want to talk about is James Hannigan because because I'm I'm I, I just can't stop listening to your music and it's just fabulous and uh, I don't want to throw too many um, just over the top compliments but it's just I mean it really has moved me and there's so much going on in it but so let's let's quickly do a rundown of some things. Um, and then I want to talk about Games Music Connect. And uh, 20 years ago, let's do that. 20 years ago, you uh, you came into this industry. Uh, very quickly, I believe, you started working with EA? Yeah, I did a couple of... Uh, I mean, I was working in other areas. I was, you know, writing bits of TV stuff and right. uh, library music when I was sort of very, very early 20s. Uh, yeah, I, got, I, I did a couple of 
games on a freelance basis. Even then, there was a little bit of a freelance market. Um, and that, you know, I think it was MIDI files or something I provided. <laughs> so that was even, wow. you know, because I, I, I don't know, I even the way that I made music back then kind of fit today, really. I think I was, I, as, as I say, I came from that kind of um, more the sort of film TV end, at least in terms of my approach. I, I'm not a kind of uh, chip music composer or anything. I was going to say, would you as much as just... I admire those people, yeah. you know, it's not, it's just never been my thing. Although I enjoy listening to it. Um, yeah. So I, I, after doing a couple of games, I can't remember what they were. Um, <laughs> That's fine. There's a, well, I worked on a few Warhammer games, but there was a Warhammer one. Shadow of the Horned Rat. Yeah. That's Does probably it... about 1994 or something. That was one of my favourite games, got to tell you. I used to, play, yeah. I used to play that thing to death. <laughs> and that was uh, MIDI, MIDI-based. Really? I don't, yeah. I, I don't. To be honest, I don't really remember the soundtrack at this point, but no. I, I might look it up. <laughs> um, well, at least my part of it was. Yeah. Um, but uh, then... Yeah, I went to work at EA quite quickly. I just thought, well, yeah, let's do this. Oh, yeah. It's a relatively new industry, something new to explore. But I've got to admit, at the time, I did sort of think, well, this isn't really me. There was a sort of sense of, what is this weird (laughs) going into an office to be a composer thing? You know, I just couldn't understand it. Like, why do they have this? I I mean, I kind of know why now, because I've thought about it so much. But... um, I just couldn't, I didn't see it as compatible or particularly sort of, um, or compatible with the creative process, really, at least for me, to be in a nine to five job or nine to six or whatever it was. Um, it just seems strange being a composer and in house because in every other industry, you, you, you just, you know, composers are free agents and they just, just work wherever they are or in their own studios. Yeah, so I sure. just yeah, travel, and it's yeah. like that now. In but of course there are still in-house people. But you know, it's a slightly alien concept to me, and it was something that I struggled with quite a bit. And the, I struggled with the sort of computery, the computer industry feel to the industry. Mm. And to be honest, I still do a bit. It still hasn't quite shaken it off. I mean, not that anybody cares what I think, but I mean, you know, it's just I certainly sort of, do. I think a well, lot of people you. do. But I mean, yeah, it's just that. It's just so obvious, isn't it, that the the computer that the the games the games industry came out of the computer industry. Right. I mean, it's not you know that's not to knock it or say that it isn't great. It's just that the culture is very very corporate, and this whole concept of having people in a an industrial park and all that kind of thing. It's like you're running a computer company. You know, software mm. development, um, and it's not as bad now, but. Back then, it did feel like that. It felt like, well, it was working for a software company. Yeah, sure, sure. You know, it felt like going to work at a computer company. And I just felt, well... I'm a composer, I'm a... Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, but, you know, obviously, it's it's nice to be in work. And I wanted to learn from the experience. And I was interested in games. And I, I stuck around for a few years and um, then just left. And I was going to say, what was what prompted that? Well, it was, was just that. It was just that I thought, why, why, why do things in this way? Like, let's see if I can. What? Be, just, yeah, just take the risk, take the gamble of throwing myself back into freelance work, but see if I can continue working in games, even though it's actually quite unusual. Right, right. You know, um, it isn't unusual now, now to do yeah. it that way, but uh, it was then, and it was incredibly risky. Um, and as it turned out. Um, I started, you know, I continued working with EA almost immediately. Mm. So it just shows really, you know, people, some, well, you just have to take risks. So what's your ideal, what's, what's, what's your ideal sort of working, um, or is, is there not one? Is, is there like an ideal working process, uh, location wise, for instance, logistics wise or anything well, like I that? I just need to live a life, you know, outside an office. That's all it was. It was just, I, I feel that life plays an important role in shaping you. And I say, I'm not saying people who work at these companies don't have a life, but I just mean the, the more you can, well, I don't know. I find that, you know, a kind of meditation or a sort of going for a walk, I can be creative. Yeah, I can get ideas yeah. doing that. But if you're stuck in a, a room and you're just sort of told to compose, yeah, uh, yeah. you know, it's not, that's not how it works for me. No. I, 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 when I'm in my studio, when I'm writing music, I'm actually just fleshing out the ideas I got when I was going for a walk, 
Do you see what I mean? Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I get my ideas when I'm not doing the work. Mm. It's, you know, when I go to Japan or something and I, I wander around, I might hear some music in my mind. I think, oh, you know, because that's what I did. I did that kind of lots of traveling around the, Japan and the States. Right. I left EA. And I don't know, I just found it to be very motivating, just sort of getting out there in a sense of adventure and looking for work and in a sort of new industry. And I, I went to Texas and met uh, Martin Galway. I don't know if you know Martin Galway, who's a bit of a legendary chip music man, actually. Right. Um, and, uh, know the name, not entirely I, sure. Yeah. yeah, he was uh, sort of audio director at Digital Anvil, and that led to me working on a few games for them, like Freelancer and... Um, game called conquest but it just felt so exciting to be able to sort of maneuver yourself into this position and not essentially you know sort of determine your own destiny if you see what i mean and it feeds into the process it just makes you more creative that sounds like very very important um but of course that does, you know that may not work for everybody some people love the security of a job or yeah, the sure. in-house environment suits them and they don't mind sitting in you know being in that environment a lot of the time or maybe they're not as inhibited and they can they've got freedom of movement but not every company is like that no, absolutely not. I'm, mm. uh, yeah, I've heard, but you know, both I've heard Olivier Derivier, uh, you know, traveling and doing crazy things with orchestras and doing all this stuff. And I've heard from some friends who work in a, a smaller situation in a local company who literally do sit and uh, if, if, I like the way you described it. It sounds like a software company. It sounds like a early nineties. Yeah, sat in a white I would say that at EA it was never so bad that we had to sit with headphones. Well, actually, we did, but that was kind of our choice because <laughs> yeah, sure. there was a fantastic studio. Even I mean, it was way ahead of his time oh that's cool that's yeah cool. i mean had proper acoustics it was a purpose-built studio you know with a concrete shell double skin i don't know i can't remember the spec but it was a very very good proper studio, studio yeah. and uh recording environment and a great great place to be to learn right no that's that's amazing so so um yeah, one of the th one of the most interesting things I've seen recently, one of the soundtracks I can't get out of my head. I'm not sure if you you probably definitely heard it is um, Gustavo Santaolalla uh, and his soundtrack for um, The Last of Us. Yeah, I've heard snatches of it, but I haven't played the game. Believe it or not. Oh yeah. wow! Well, first I of know, all, it's I'm, on my, it's just, I'm not yeah, even it's not, I'm not even going to address. It, I'm, well, it shouldn't be. It should I be a ticked off. I, everybody's. <laughs> yeah, I know. Sorry, but James. I have heard fragments of the music, but not in context. Right. Well, because what I would love to do is. Um, you know, I would love it if you played that, and sometime I'll bug you on the phone because I'd love to hear what you think about that. Partly because um, we're going to talk about games music connect now, but one thing I wanted to say, um, and I and, and it was on my mind, was you talking about how films influence games, and, and actually Neil Druckmann, who's a creative director over at Naughty Dog, and I have a tremendous mm. amount of respect for the man. Um, he actually watched uh, the No Country for Old Men, right, and. Yeah. Yeah. It sort of ties into what you were saying in that he, mm. he was amazed, well, there's actually not that much music. Less is more. Yeah. Less is more. And it was very powerful. And so he contacted yeah. Gustavo and said, can we do something like this? Uh, yeah. So, I mean, I mean, that's probably well, the exception, isn't you. it? And you know what that's all about, I guess. I mean, and I completely, you know, I'm all for it. It's the, it's giving the composer or having a the designer understand that, a composer, you know, their role is not just to create music, but it's to enhance experience. Yeah, enhance the experience and understand how to apply music as well. Oh, okay, that's the way. And been, uh, yeah. you know, knowing when to have uh, when music should be absent, right? Yeah, to have the most impact. I mean, it sounds very easy, but actually, I think it's <laughs> very it's difficult not. to make a decision like that about when not to have music. And part of the problem in games is that. There, you know, there are so many sort of assumptions that are made about when you should hear music, you know, and it's just triggered here and there, you know, combat on, combat off, right, exploration yeah, yeah. on, exploration off. And it's very sort of, um, gen there's a very sort of generalized approach to it without thinking about the, it's not particularly nuanced or uh, doesn't operate. Um, I don't know, the, the composer isn't given a great deal of say all the time about where the music should be and uh why it should be there right and there's not yeah not not a lot of contrasting things like you said before things do tend yeah. to reinforce the obvious again, you know that's 
I think that again, that's just that's how the role. It, it depends on your role, uh, the view of the what the role of the composer should be. And with a lot of these companies, uh, and evidently not Naughty Dog, um, you know, they tend to sort of see composers as a kind of composing machine. Really, it's just like we, you know, we want a, a soundtrack that sounds like this. We like this film. We want that style. Mm. We want combat music here, and the composer isn't always allowed into that process or they have to kind of fight their way into it you know no absolutely that's this is what i want to highlight because this is the, the the crux of this interview is, has been this very overwhelming I mean, point if, i think if writing for games is an art if it's a true art hmm. then it has to be about the application as well as just writing music you know i can write epic trailer music so what you know what i mean it's that it's got to be it's where you hear this music and why you hear it that counts i mean when you when we talk about great film composers, that's what we're talking about. Yeah. There are loads of people who yeah. can write music like that on the surface of it. Like, yeah. I mean, the exciting thing. Yeah, oh, yeah. Yeah, exactly. And anyone can do, you know, just a fragment of this and a fragment of that. But to have it all kind of hang together as a whole and mean something and really add to the experience, that's the art. Mm. It's all bound up together. Oh, I love uh, that. Yeah. And I think that, um, you know, when we talk about great composers film composers like jerry goldsmith it's it's with you know we're talking about the music that he can write and his style and unmistakable voice but we're also you know we're talking about his decisions as well about what you know how he applies music and that's the art of composing for film and the same should be true in games uh, you know the problem we've got at the moment and i understand why people think like this but i think it's slightly misguided they just think music is music if it's if it's good, it's just good music, right? Yeah, but it's applied music. We're talking about music to picture. You know, we're talking about music that has a function in context. We're not just talking about writing music that's good in isolation. Mm. We're talking about music that has a role to play in that experience. And so, there should be such a thing as a games composer. You know, someone who really understands the medium, knows how music functions in the game. That's what I feel. Absolutely. Not just, oh, we'll just grab this guy from film. I mean, it's fine. Of course, there are going to be loads of film composers who can do it and are intelligent enough to, you know, adapt and are interested by games. And I can't, there's no harm in that crossing over. But I do think that this, this specialism, you know, this role of the games composer should be recognized as unique, at least when they're in that role. Do you see what I mean? Absolutely. So a person could be a good film composer and a good games composer but not necessarily approach a game like it's a film right a, yeah oh absolutely do i yeah, mm. absolutely see what you mean and then that, that's be one facet of, yeah of but i think that's the takeaway from from what this has been uh so far it's just uh, so interesting but also so uh powerful i've learned a lot and, and so so uh but by the way just one note i realized i mispronounced it's gustavo sante Elia. uh sorry i just need to say that it bothered me um uh, but i i little things <laughs> but um no so so uh to cap that off and then let's talk about this wonderful uh conference and um and a little bit more about you uh just just what was i mean is there an ideal situation for games composers right now? What would you say if you're talking to, let's say, uh, people like me? I mean, I mean, I'm more in the indie world, but but people people like me, but in AAA or people any any kind of game, what do you want them to do uh, with regards to game composer? Is there a process that in, do you have them on board from day one? Do you have them just involved in 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 what kind of way? What would you say this is the message you want them to take away? Um. Sorry to put you, you on know, the spot. <laughs> yeah, it's, no, it's tricky because, you know, as I was saying earlier, every publisher, every developer has its own culture. Sure. And depending on their views of uh, development um, goals and milestones, you know, they, they, some will, you know, they have a very kind of fixed time frame. And they say, you know, we're making this game. It's got to be out in one year. And they just won't miss that date. And there are others who just say, well, it's done when it's done. You know, it's finished uh -huh. when it's finished. And, uh, you know, there are pros and cons working for both of those types of company. Um, I mean, ideally, I think longer is better, but you don't want to be tied into something for five years as a freelancer because it doesn't mean you're paid anymore, probably, for doing the work. And it can actually become a kind of... Um, like an anchor. 
yeah, it's a, it can become a little bit of a problem if you're, it's something you thought was going to last for six months and mm. then it's going on for two years. Um, it sounds like a nightmare, actually. <laughs> yeah, and also it, it means there's more scope for constantly sort of reinventing the game and changing it, and that could be good, but uh, it's probably better for people working in-house than it is people outside who have other things to do or have a schedule they've got to move on to other things so i don't know i quite like the idea of you know i I hate things that are really rushed i mean i hate it when i mean it's happened actually i've got to say the results weren't too bad but i've had situations where uh people have said oh you know it's we've got to finish this in one month and we want a fully orchestral score uh you know, including all the music preparation and orchestration and everything and recording at somewhere like Abbey Road. Mm. And uh, it's, uh, you know, it makes you panic, but you you just get on with it. But there isn't any time to think in, think very deeply about it. You just kind of get on with it. But, you know, you rely on your instincts and sometimes it, it works out. So I think something between the two, something, you know, the companies that do deliver their, you know, finish their games when they say they're going to, that's great, but maybe giving you six months or a year would be ideal because uh-huh. it gives you some lead time and gives you some time to experiment, but you still know when you're going to get out of it. So I would say probably, you know, only involve the composer when you sort of know what your game's about and you know what the music, you know, what's motivating it or and you're ready to hear what the composer has to say. Don't see it as a sort of thing you're kind of adding on at the end try and include them in the design process, see what they can bring to the game and give them enough time right. yeah. to allow some formula, something, some working relationship to evolve and some ideas to emerge before you go into full production on it. So right um, in the middle, basically, of those two yeah, extremes. Probably. Yeah, probably. Yeah, I think so. I think you can get involved too early. Yeah. What about... What about um, I mean, again, I'm going to use it as an example just because I watched the documentary. Um, I think that he they probably did what you're describing. Uh, it's interesting when, when I watched Neil Druckmann as the creative director, you know, having access, what about having access to the artwork and all that stuff? Would you wait until it's your time and they've got, like you said, they've got the voice of the game, then have the opportunity to sort of be immersed in the world and see everything rather than see it evolve? No, actually, I think because um, a lot of the see again it goes back to this role you know what is the role of the music in the game and i think a lot of the time in games you do sort of um you have to think you know you're working in a vacuum really if you're not composing to picture Mm. if there isn't anything tangible like that to work, you know, if you're not sort of, there's a timeline. I mean, if you're working with cutscenes, these linear sequences, then obviously it's a bit of a no-brainer. It's still difficult, but I mean, it's a very well understood process, and it's like working on a film or the TV. But for the game itself, I think you, you know, there are other things that motivate the music that you can kind of know about in advance, so long as they don't change an awful lot, uh-huh. like situations you're going to be in and the overall tone of the game, the atmosphere, the kind of feeling that the designers want to create no absolutely so yeah yeah. so you can you probably can start writing music before you see the game right but i think it's sort of um yeah because you see if you start filling it with all these little stories and you start injecting a narrative into it then you're, you're just overstepping the mark anyway in games i mean i just don't think that's how games music operates most of the time you know, i don't think it's there to kind of well you know because you see the more of a story that you put into the music that is doesn't correspond mm. with what you're seeing on the screen then the more detachable and disconnected the music becomes doesn't it it's just sort of something Absolutely. on top that just sort of has an exciting bit here and a, you know all this light and shade in it for no reason it's just sort of what's that it's just like a uh, music I mean, it, <laughs> might sound, it might sound good but what does it mean yeah so yeah. um but you can create atmospheric music, textural music that creates the right kind of atmosphere mm. that doesn't comment on what you're doing. But, you know, it's sort of this is what you want the player to feel in Some... this area of the game or this location. No, I think that, I think that makes a lot of sense. And I think yeah. it's really interesting to hear, especially I, th- I know there are some aspiring um video game composers that listen to my show and they've written in uh in the past when we've had video game composers on Winifred Phillips and um and uh Yoav Gorin who was not video game composer but we've also had Olivier uh yeah. who, and and 
it's it's fascinating to hear this. It's, I, I love. Um, yeah, I, just to be honest, this has been an hour of really interesting opinions on on this stuff, and I hope that everybody that listens. Yeah, I think I think everyone. I know that I personally, as someone who once upon a time, you know, dreamed of doing what you do for a living, and uh, sort of went another way, but I still love what you do for a living and i i constantly my my entire iphone is just video game soundtracks and uh you know i'm so interested in this stuff but um you know sorry. i want to love it you know i really want to that's, continue yeah, loving it that's, that's, that's <laughs> but the... it's it's getting harder i find you know wow. it's yeah i mean i hate saying that but um just the climate and so these things that we were talking about earlier about the the kind of forced direction of certain mm. games and uh, you know i just yeah, I mean, I love it, and I love the possibilities that games present. I just wish that um, more trust was put Thrown into your designers way. and composers and content creators. And the connection between the designers and composers was was more yes. was yeah, it was stronger. And um, absolutely, that's I mean, that's really and I, I like you said, everyone has their individual culture, but as a sort of a mean of the industry, um, I I hope that people take on board uh especially you know anyone that's listening today i hope that everyone's learned something but i hope that more and more people do take on board this stuff i hope you keep saying it james i really do because it, to me i was kind of down and out of 20 minutes ago and now i'm actually excited because i'm like i think more vocal people like you can actually do something can actually help the evolution of this stuff and can actually make people go should we be doing it like this you <laughs> well, know uh, yeah i mean i've got to say i mean you know 10 years ago when i did that develop thing i told you about I had that kind of sense of optimism about it. You know, it's really, it's going to be an art form. And oh, right, it's yeah. like, like people feel about the indie sector now. You know, I felt that that was happening then and was going to be, you know, it's going to break away from this. We don't need to be like this and chase the coattails of film. And even though I like it, as I say, I've got that kind of conflict <laughs> sure, 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 sure. myself. Um, but, uh, you know, I feel it again now a little bit. I've got to say, it's coming back a bit, the optimism. I mean, I actually deliberately kind of withdrawn a bit from games in the last couple of years i haven't i sort of slightly lost interest oh wow but um i find myself kind of being drawn back a little bit because well partly because of all this buzz around the indie sector but also because i've you know in creating games music connect game music connect with with john it's sort of um well, there's a platform to talk about some of these things at least in relation to music and that's really what lies behind it Mm. it's a you know to create a debate there isn't an, an a corporate agenda or anything like that behind this event it's not for to serve any particular sector of the industry or particular company it Quite is the very, yeah it's purely you know to discuss the art of making music for games and to talk about the possibilities and the personal experiences people have working on games and uh, to look at the aesthetics of it all, I mean, that's the ultimate goal. Right. So so for anyone listening, uh, I will have talked about this in the intro, but uh, for anyone listening, uh, it's two weeks from now, I believe. Yeah. Two 24th, weeks. Wednesday the 24th. Wednesday the 24th. Um, I will be in London, is it? I believe. Yeah. <laughs> I know South, I'm going to be there. I've got to be in the South right Bank Oh, at the South Bank Centre, no less. So at the South Bank Centre at the 24th, James, uh, as, as the rock star of the event, I will be somewhat just hiding in the background, but please, uh, you know, if anyone's interested in going or, or looking this up, look it up. It's We're talking about Games Music Connect. Uh, it's James and John Broomhalls. Uh, they're, they're the co-founders. Yeah, John's the, yeah we, we founded it. And uh, John's the host. He's an excellent host. Um, he's also, he hosts, a, I don't know if you know, the Develop Conference. Yeah. And he's just got such a relaxed style. Mm. And, you know, he just gives people the space to talk and to talk about some of these things he does there's no agenda there you know he doesn't try and determine what people say or try and bend them to his you know will and sort of make them talk about the things that he thinks are important he he's just such an excellent host so that sounds exciting that sounds mm -hmm. like a, it sounds like the sort of place to learn a lot and i'm i'm, I'm trying to learn to be more like john <laughs> um <laughs> but no i i uh in the last hour i mean this well, has you've been let me talk about it things that don't often come up uh, well, to, to be honest uh you know i'd rather have someone like you who's actually got strong opinions lead me down the 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 the, the path and, and and 
the you garden, know, lead you down the garden right, path. That was not the expression I went for. I started, I started I saying joking. it and then I thought, no, and I started saying it and I thought, I've just said the wrong thing. <laughs> um, I'm aware that I sometimes yeah. come out with stuff, but no, I, uh, as you, as you began, I had, you know, I was going to do a, a general biography, but when, when we started talking about this stuff, I would much rather let someone like you who has strong opinions go because I've just learned so much. That's the most important thing about all this stuff. I've just come away learning. I know my, my listeners will come away learning and feeling that they've learned something important. Um, so, so who's going to be at the conference? What can we expect? Uh, and, uh, and, and anything else that you think is really important about, about games music connecting the two weeks we got to count down? Um, well, we've got, uh, it mostly composers this year. I mean, generally we, we want, you know, we're trying to sort of take, uh, the composers, uh, side of the story and right. combine it with the audio directors because we find that very interesting, you know, the sort of dynamic, um, to talk about the the experience of working with uh, on particular games and with particular audio directors, but this year we don't. We're a bit sort of low on audio directors, but um, we have Gary Scheinman, mm-hmm. who's um, this year's BAFTA Award winner for Original Music and Games Awards, and he'll be talking about his um, experiences working on the Bioshock games. Very cool. Of course, we have Olivier. And he'll, Who doesn't love Olivier? He's yeah, he's a great. fabulous he, guy. Yeah, and he'll be talking about Remember Me. And well, not necessarily about, you know, we, we have to sort of equate each person with some of, of the things course, that they've yeah. done, you know. And uh, we have uh, a keynote from Steve Schnur, who is basically EA's head music man. He's like the worldwide executive head of music at EA and you know he everything goes through him anything relating oh, to wow. music, all contracts relating to music or you know everything to in EA sports games all the licensing he handles that side of things and he you know he's fantastic he'll be delivering the the, the opening talk um also, that's interesting because obviously he's going to then, if he stays, he's going to go back with the thoughts of the, plenty of composers to the powerhouse that is EA. Uh, I mean, that's kind of interesting. Yeah. Uh, props to but EA. I, I, mean, he, I think he, you know he's aware of uh, the situation. What, yeah, he, he's he's just so on the wall. He knows what's happening, and um, you know, I'm sure he thinks about all these issues. So, um, but I'm you know obviously I'm hoping. All our speakers enjoy the experience of taking part as well and learn from each other. Yeah. But um, th- that's, you know, I think that will be interesting, though, uh, to have somebody at the very top of the tree at EA talk about how they work with composers and where they think music and games is going. Mm. I mean, that's going to be fascinating. Um, yeah, I think I think it just sounds really exciting. I'm, I'm unbelievably looking forward to it i can't tell you jason graves coming back oh wow great he's, you know he's fantastic he's such a great speaker and we've got a little bit more of a, an emphasis this year on uh, interactive music because something that came out of last year uh some of the feedback we had sort of indicated that this was something we needed to look at in a little bit more depth okay so although we're going to talk about um you know the philosophical side of things we're also talk about the practicalities of uh, interactive music as well so um, that's that should be good no absolutely so i mean and and, and it's i just think it's it sounds really cool <laughs> i've not been to a conference before for well, video game yeah, music enjoy it. it's, yeah um, yeah don't worry i'm sure i'm not going to come away going ah terrible <laughs> <laughs> you never know. why did that james have you <laughs> take me yeah <laughs> but um no it's it's really interesting and it sounds like there's some great speakers uh is is jesper kid there not this year no oh what a shame that's the one person i keep trying to track down <laughs> um but no that's uh that's um that's great so uh games music connect is on the 24th the wednesday of september in the south black center in london i'm going to be there please come can you can people buy tickets by the way still yeah they can yeah i was going to say we need to do this we need to plug this thing you know yeah, uh, so do it quickly because they are getting quite low we have got to, oh really uh, There's yeah. a, tickets are running out guys come on i mean yeah. uh, and uh, and you but, can uh, you know there, there are several speakers i haven't mentioned and i you know but so please check out the site you know because we're covering indie music as well and you know please check it out and you know there's something something for everyone basically i mean it's sort of you know we're covering so many different sectors and so many angles trying to be as inclusive as possible right 
So you I'll, know, post, I'll post all this of, stuff up. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, sorry, okay. sorry, James. No, no, that's fine. That's... I just say I will post all this, uh, the schedule and everything up. We'll put it on the website, um, so do check it out. And uh, and no, it's 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 just been, um, you know, the thing is, I I, I really want to ask about the other ten years of your career. There is so much stuff that we we really haven't covered today. Uh, and all I can say is, I, I, I'm going to leave it because I want you to come back on sometime. I'm going to twist your arm because I had such a wonderful time, and uh, I have learned so much. And to be honest, just to go straight into essentially opinions, uh, personal experience and, and philosophies of, of game music has been really f- just fascinating and more than I expected. And, uh, it's changed my opinion. And uh, honestly, I am a video game as a, as a video game, uh, as I say, an indie video game producer and mm. people like me, we need to know this stuff. We need to know how do we treat our composers? How do we get them involved yeah, in the process? I mean, that's another thing. I, I kind of worry a little bit about the indie sector feeling it needs to completely reinvent the wheel. Right. I mean, I agree. It's it's it is important for there to be some kind of uh, discussion, mm. isn't there? I mean, you yeah. know, for, to, to learn from each other. I would Absolutely. rather I would rather know when I'm when we work on. Uh, I actually can't say either. So <laughs> when I work on my my, uh, <laughs> it's called. But uh, when I work on um, when we're working on that, we're beginning a, a brand new game in January using some amazing new technology that I am unbelievably excited about, and it's and it's actually something I, I would love to talk about you uh, talk about with uh, James privately because uh, we're doing something no one else has done before and right. I'm, I'm going to learn hopefully a lot from this conference but it's going to come down to the fact we have not yet got a composer we we are you know trying to gauge I mean it's not, that's that's what's interesting from from the perspective of it, uh, someone in my position you've got to gauge who and what and where and, and all these things and, and mm. what's going to be the right fit and can we afford the right fit you know that's what's sure. important and uh, and so no I've, I feel like I've taken away at least at least about seven or eight I've been counting really strong points that I can think well that's sort of changed my opinion and uh, that's what we're here for so so guys I mean Honestly, I, I, I want to say I, just a massive thank you to my guest, James Hannigan. And uh, and it's just been a thrilling episode. James, I can't wait to meet you in person in two weeks. And I hope we can continue this discussion again. Uh, and uh, thank you so much for coming on the show. Yeah, thank you for having me. It's been great. Thank you. You have an absolutely great day. Yeah, you too. Do you have something you'd like to share with us? Find us on Twitter at The Note Show or The Note Show at gmail.com. That's our show, everybody. I want to thank Aaron Dowd, my editor. I want to thank Locke Ishmael. And I want to say, Locke, congratulations on getting engaged to Matthew Broderick. And the fact that there is nothing wrong with that sentence is amazing to me. I love the fact that you are so happy that Matthew is so happy. Matthew seems like a great guy and we're really, really stoked. We're all really happy for you. And I can't wait to, you know, come trash your wedding and uh, be that awkward guest that you really wish you didn't have to invite, but I'm your boss. So you're probably going to have to invite me. That's the way these things work. Let's see what happens. Seriously though. Congratulations to both of you. I wish you all the love and all the luck in the world. And I, I just can't wait to meet Matthew in person. So without further ado, guys, like I said, we'll be back we're looking forward to having our friend matt donnelly eric peterson david brin so much cool stuff and uh, and we will see you very soon this is the note show my name is joshua no thanks guys thank you for listening to the note show be sure to have a nosy around the note show.com and subscribe on itunes we'll see you next time <laughs>